I'm pretty sure you're not expecting to see me in this format. What happened is that the first part of uh, our Sabbath school lesson had a challenge with the sound, so the sound was not recorded. So I'm just re-recording the first maybe 15 minutes of my presentation, Genesis chapters 47 and 48, which is the section right after the centerpiece of uh, the Joseph cycle, of the Joseph story. You probably remember from last time that the focal point of the Joseph cycle is Israel, and we have that genealogy of Israel in chapter 46, and uh, before and right after, we have the movement and then the settling down in Egypt. So, the center of this chiastic structure is practically how God takes care of the people of Israel. Israel being Jacob and his descendants. Now, right after that, we have another section where Joseph's wisdom is emphasized. And we had a similar section right before the center piece. So wisdom of Joseph before the focal point and wisdom of Joseph after the focal point. Both of those sections speak about how Joseph becomes the hero of Egypt and also of his own family, the guy that solves the famine issue. Now, right after that, we have uh, the story of Jacob blessing Joseph's two sons. What is interesting in that story is that instead of blessing them in the order of their birth, Manasseh being the firstborn and Ephraim the second, when uh, Joseph brings them in front of uh, Jacob, instead of doing this, Jacob does this. So there is a reversed order of the two sons. A reversed order very similar to what you can find in the story of Judah's two sons. You have Perez and Zerah there. And you know from chapter 38 that uh, one of them was about to come out. And uh, the midwife even uh, put a string on his uh, wrist, but then he pulled back. So the other came out first. So you have a reversal of the order of those two sons. That's just to emphasize that uh, indeed there is a parallelism between those two sections. And uh, also we have some words that are repeated in those two sections, words like hand, favor, blessing, Lehem, which means bread. Lehem, Bethlehem, house of bread. So, as uh, we are looking now at chapters 47 and uh, 48, the story is about Joseph, Joseph's exaltation over all Egypt, the way he handles the famine issue. Now his family is down in uh, Egypt. And uh, if before Joseph was the overseer of uh, how they were collecting the grains, the food, for the seven years of famine, during the seven years of well-being, of plenty. Now Joseph is the one that provides for the food of the people. There's something very 
strange happening there in the story because yes we have uh, food in Egypt and uh, Joseph is the one that gives people food and people come to buy food they pay they bring their money but at one point there's no more money so they start bringing their animals after a while there's no more animal to bring so they sell their lands they trade practically their lands for food but they also get to the point where they sell themselves to the pharaoh and they become slaves of the pharaoh so one would rightly ask okay joseph why are you doing this is this what god's will was what god's desire is we also read that uh, he established a rule that from the seed that he was providing to the people the people would uh, be able to sow the land and then out of the harvest one-fifth goes to the pharaoh and four-fifths go to them that's 20 percent versus 80 percent but remember the land is not theirs and they are servants of the pharaoh servants that's the word used by most translations but the fact of the matter is they are slaves what is important to notice in the text so please go and read chapter 47 that it is actually the egyptians that ask for this so after their money is gone and after their animals have been traded for food they come to joseph and they ask for him to take their lands to take uh, them and they will serve the pharaoh and may the pharaoh give them seed so yes joseph provides seed but the lands are not theirs in fact the text also says that joseph moves them from their lands into cities so he dislocates the population of uh, the land workers of the farmers of the agricultural population and they become city people so that is weird i'm uh, emphasizing this because you know here we have a guy a wise guy that god uses in a certain context in a certain historic situation but it's very hard to judge what joseph does in those circumstances with the expectations of the 21st century because this slavery kind of thing is very hard to understand not to mention that at this point his family is already in Egypt and the text says the same chapter that they're in the land of Goshen where they settle down and uh, Joseph intentionally arranged things in a way that they will be given that territory of Goshen a very fertile land where they can can continue their normal life of uh, shepherds and uh, cattle herders so um, they are there some of his brothers are even elevated probably because the pharaoh offers that to become chief herdsmen of uh, pharaoh's cattle but they continue their life there and the text says that they have possessions they have their possessions there 
in uh, Goshen, while the population of Egypt is slowly moved toward slavery. Joseph provides for them. Joseph provides for the entire land of Egypt. That's what the story says. But while his family can keep their properties, the families of the Egyptians, they become slaves to the Pharaoh. And then later on, weirdly enough, we will see that Joseph's family or Jacob's family, they themselves become slaves. Joseph's memory is uh, lost, is forgotten. And the new Pharaoh comes, and we are now in the time of uh, Moses. We see that they become slaves themselves. So they lose their possessions. Not only that, they are exploited. The story goes on, and uh, Jacob wants Joseph to promise him something solemnly. So he asks Joseph to place his hand under his thigh. Yeah, that's pretty weird but that's a procedure that we already know from the time of Abraham when Abraham was sending his guy Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac he asked him to swear to promise solemnly to make an oath that he would not take Isaac to the land of uh, his family, Bethuel, Laban, and uh, the rest of them. But he will bring the wife there to the land of Canaan. Joseph promises. That's what uh, Jacob wants. Joseph promises that he will not bury him there in Egypt. In other words... Jacob asks that uh, when he dies, he will be taken up to Canaan and buried. He will be buried there. That's all from here. And now we are going to the recording from the church. Let, oh, let me lie with my fathers. He didn't say, take me home to heaven. But let me lie with my fathers. Just emphasizing this to show that the idea that the dead are resting in their graves was already known for Jacob. Because there is this conception very popular in American evangelical circles and in historical Christianity that when somebody dies, you go home. No, he wanted to lie with his fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And uh, he, that is Joseph, said, I will do as you have said. And we know later in the story, that's what he did. Then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. 48. In 48, we have a very interesting story. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. So if your father is old and sick, what do you think? He may pass away. So he comes with his two sons. What is the order of the sons again? Who's the eldest? Who's the youngest? Manasseh. And then Ephraim. And Jacob is told, look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. And 
Jacob speaks to Joseph and tells him what God told him because he had some conversations with God when he was going down to Egypt. You have this story because the whole chapter is a chiastic structure here. The blessing of Joseph's sons. Jacob is ready to bless Joseph's two sons. Joseph brings them in front of his father and according to the normalcy of the time, he places the firstborn where? To his right hand and the secondborn left hand, waiting for his father to lift his hands and do the blessing position. And uh, what does Jacob do? Switches the two guys. Joseph notices. And what, what does Joseph do? Brings his father's hands back. Very funny situation. Not like this father, because that's, that's the correct order. And he says, I know. I know. And yet he goes on with the reversed order. And he blessed Joseph, verse 15. So please understand that although the blessing goes directly to the grandsons, Jacob blesses Joseph, according to verse 15. And he says, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. With that blessing, Ephraim and Manasseh, grandsons, become Jacob's sons. Verse 21 says, Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. All we have left from the story is that in chapter 49, there is a blessing or curse that Jacob places upon each one of his sons, and then in chapter 50, he dies. He passes away, and what do they do with him? They bring him to Canaan and bury him there. Correct? Look at verse 22. That's the last verse in 48. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Did you know this about Jacob? That he used his sword and bow to take some portions from the Amorite? We haven't seen Jacob fighting, waging a war up to this point. And the text, like in passing, just mentions it. I just emphasize this, that again, we are dealing with a guy in a historical context. It was pretty common in those days that some people will take the land of some other people. Remember, in the past, there was a moment when Jacob bought lands. When he was at the city of Shechem, he bought lands there. And then he had to move on from there. Why? Because of what his sons did. 
there. More specifically, Simeon and Levi. And he was very unhappy about how they used the sword. According to the text, it seems that Jacob, probably some other time, he himself used the sword and the bow. How, in what ways, we are not given details. What is interesting is that normally it is the firstborn that receives double portion. So practically in Jacob's case, since he had 12 sons, he would have to prepare, so to speak, how many portions to give out? 12? 13. Why? So you have... 12 plus 1. Because one of them receives two portions. Who receives the two portions? Joseph. Jacob says that in verse 22. I have given to you one portion above your brothers. Right? So he has the portion he normally would get, plus one. That's why he brought in both of his grandsons, Joseph's descendants. That's interesting. Because this only concerns, really, the material part of the blessing. The spiritual part of the firstborn right goes to whom? It goes to Judah. Now you may think, okay, so why are you, Jacob, doing this? Did God tell Jacob to do this reverse kind of order with uh, Ephraim and Manasseh? Is there anything in the text that says that? I haven't found that. Does that mean that uh, it was just Jacob's idea? We don't know. Question. Would Jacob have had the right to do that even if God had not told him to do so? They were his children. And Jacob does a lot of um, weird things when it comes to his children. Because Reuben is the firstborn, he doesn't treat Reuben in any way like he was the firstborn. So all his firstborn favors go to Joseph and Judah, none of them being the first, not even the second, because Judah is the fourth, and Joseph is the second for, from uh, the end, right? In a way, Joseph was the firstborn. In Jacob's mind, it seems it has never gone away that he was tricked into getting married to all these other women. In his mind, he should have been married with whom? Rachel! Rachel! And the firstborn of Rachel was Joseph. Problem fixed. And he kind of fixes it. How Judah becomes the one that carries on the lineage of Jesus Christ? Hard to say, but we'll see about that Next time, more. Questions now? Uh, so chapter 37. Yeah, verse 10, yeah. So verse 10 here says, Jacob speaking to Joseph. What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? Question is, 
What mother? Because at this time, his mother is passed. Right? Rachel passed away when Benjamin was born. Genesis 35 is when Benjamin is born and um, Rachel passes away. Then in 37, we have Jacob speaking to Joseph and says, what kind of dream is this? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? The only way I can take this is in a sarcastic kind of way in which Jacob kind of tells Joseph, look, this is hilarious. How can you even imagine something like this? Like your defunct mother and I and your brothers are going to bow down to you. What kind of dream is this? Please notice that Joseph never explains what the dream means. Because in theory, if you want to interpret the dream, this is how the dream goes. In the dream, there are 12 stars, right? The sun and the moon. The way Jacob explains it or interprets it, the sun stands for whom? For the father, right? The moon stands for whom? The mother. But can't the moon also stand for mothers, like collectively? For all four of them? Because they are a family. If we go with this interpretation, they are a family in which they have one son and uh, they still have three moons. One moon disappeared. You understand how uh, I try to visualize this? But the way Jacob, Jacob takes it is, uh, hey, 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 Joseph, really. Now, your mother, and that's, that's the one that he starts with. Normally, in a patriarchal mindset, you may um, think that he should have said, so you think me or I and your mother and your brothers, but that's not the order. It's your mother and I and your brothers. To me, it suggests that Jacob emphasizes the hilarity of it, the ridiculous nature of what Joseph has dreamt, giving him the impression, listen, son, I love you, but this is stupid. How can you even think like this? But later on, we see Jacob bowing down, so to speak, to his son. And uh, when the whole family goes down to Egypt, at one point he goes up to Goshen. He goes to meet them. And uh, most probably there is some sort of submissive attitude there involved as well. What Jacob is doing in this moment with Joseph's sons is uh, at a crucial moment of his time a way of reaffirming God's promises and also bringing Joseph's sons in who were by ethnicity half Jew and half Egyptians making them completely Jews, so Israelites, bringing them into the fellowship of his family, affirming the fact, and this is, I think, phenomenal, never thought about it, because this is Old Testament all the way back, that in the end it's not ethnicity that really counts because these are half Egyptians. Their mother 
is the daughter of a priest, a pagan priest. And yet, God takes them on as part of his family. That's fantastic to me. This answers to Genesis 47, 31. Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. Does it mean that the bed had a head like, like this and he did this? Which can be taken like that, but some of the translations say that he bowed on the staff. And that is easy to imagine. Those of you that are familiar with people that use a staff, after they do something, they, they have this moment of relief when they allow their weight to lean on that staff. And I believe, knowing a little bit uh, about the Hebraic mindset, that's what the text wants, wants to say. Because here we are after the moment when Joseph is asked to not bury him, Jacob, his father, in Egypt. So Jacob comes to his uh, son and tells him, son, my time is close. I'm going to leave. Please swear, do this for me. Be kind to me, do this for me. What, father, what? Don't bury me here. Take me home to Canaan, so to speak. And Joseph does that. That's the whole procedure of placing his hand under his tie and swears. And then this beautiful moment when the patriarch has that moment of relief when he puts his weight on the staff. Or, if somebody wants to insist on that translation, like this, on the head of the bed. Yes, that's a good question. Why don't they turn back to Canaan right after the five more years of famine are over? Because they come down to Egypt when they are already into it two years into the famine period. So practically, this five year could have been just a temporary stay for them. So don't even settle down too much. Don't open all the boxes because you are going to move on, move back to Canaan. But that's not what happens. First of all, when Jacob is going down to Egypt, that is chapter 46. God shows up to him in a vision, the text says, and tells him, I'm going down with you to Egypt. And I will make you a great nation there. So I don't think somebody can be made a great nation in five years. I mean, you can do a lot in five years if you are a large family, but the language seems to be more than just referring to what one can procreate or a family can procreate in five years. And then I will bring you back, the Lord says to Jacob. But there is something much more in the bigger picture, if you remember, when God spoke to Abraham, Abram at that time, that hundreds of years will pass before they will be able to go back and own the land. Verse 15 in chapter 15, this is what it says. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. God speaking to Abraham. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation, 
they shall return here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. For more context, verse 13, so that's a little earlier, then he said to Abram, that's still God speaking to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them. What does that speak about? We know that Joseph made all Egyptians serve the Pharaoh. But this prophecy about, is about Israel becoming a people of servants. So it says, they will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Strangers where? Where is the land that is not theirs? Goshen, yeah. In Egypt, correct. Goshen was given to them, but it was not theirs, really. It was the pharaohs. The pharaoh gave it to them. But as soon as the memory of Joseph was forgotten, not only that uh, the land was taken away from them, they became slaves. And the prophecy said it, and will serve them. You can translate it by, will be slaves to them, and they will afflict them. And we'll see in Exodus, because we are going to continue with the book of Exodus, how they afflicted them 400 years. 400 years. Okay? So, this prophecy given by God to Abram, even before he became Abraham, and then the conversation God had with Jacob probably creates the background of uh, why Jacob did not tell his sons, hey, let's go now back to Canaan now. Because remember, they go down to Egypt when the famine is going to last for five years, five more years. But Jacob dies 17 years after he goes down to Egypt. So then the famine is gone, and Jacob lives in Egypt how much more? 12 more years. Never dawns on him we should go back right away. On the contrary, he tells Joseph, don't bury me here, take me up there. So he lives with that ideal in mind. Joseph himself, because we know when Moses leads the people of Israel, the people of slaves out of Egypt, what do they do? They gather his uh, bones. In the text, you will see later, it's even mentioned that he, his body, Joseph's body, was laid in a coffin. And then they took the ossuary, probably, at that time, and uh, took it up to uh, Canaan when they left Egypt. It's like, I don't want to leave anything behind. I want to go home. Did Ephraim and Manasseh go back to Canaan? Well, in person, not. Because in all likelihood, all the brothers of Joseph and probably the next generation as well passed away. And then the descendants of them and those two um, tribes were part of the people that uh, left Egypt, yes. Very good question. How is this guy, a Hebrew guy, that interprets dreams for uh, a pagan king and some of his uh, high-ranking officials? And then he marries the daughter of a pagan priest. It wasn't his choice, according to the text. Go to verse 50 in 41. And to Joseph, 
were born two sons before the years of famine came. So in the first seven years after Joseph got out of prison, we don't know exactly when, but before the famine came, he already had two sons, these two, Ephraim and Manasseh, probably had more after that, because Jacob says when he blesses his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, that these two will carry my name. The rest of them will carry your name. You can look it up in the text. But watch now. So, to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of An, bore to him. But there is a verse, verse 45, same chapter, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Tsefnat Peniach, and he gave him, he gave him, you got it? Yeah, so he gave him as a wife, Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So it wasn't necessarily his pick, his choice. It was an arranged marriage. And I know 21st century mind will say, Joseph, how could you even do that? But it's a historical context. Like in the case of uh, Esther, we have such an Id idealized picture of Esther. Our daughters want to be Esther. We don't realize how she was forcefully given into marriage or taken into marriage by a pagan king. History is history. Lord, we thank you so much for the grace that we can experience in our lives and what we can also see in the life of the patriarchs. Some of the things that Joseph did were great things. Some of them raised questions in our minds. But Lord, we know that you work with real people in real contexts and your plans prevail in spite of human weaknesses. May we see that in our lives as well. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.